I don't know why I can't see y'all. You may not be able to hear me. We can hear, we can hear you. We oh, that's good. You. That's good. I'm glad you can hear me. We can see like a picture, just not the whole. Yeah, you can do without that was, this. You can, sure. I can, I can hear no a dog problem. barking. And of course, the dogs are barking because there's a tow truck out uh, front to tow my car to the dealership because the battery died this morning. Uh, fortunately, I wasn't on the road when it happened, but they're trying to get the car towed. So we'll see what see what happens from there. Um, but we need to talk about the important thing here is that we need to talk about um, political participation and your textbook kind of splits these chapters up in kind of an odd way. So I tried to straighten them out in your syllabus. And so what I've got us talking about uh, for the next few weeks or next few days actually is um, first uh, we'll talk about public opinion and the politics of public opinion. It's just a little short discussion about that. And we will then talk about um, voting and elections and I think we'll get to that today. And we will also uh, take a look at media uh, and political parties, uh, which I think kind of goes with voting more than media goes with voting, but, but we'll get there. And interest groups and lobbying, uh, because really what you want to grow up to be is a lobbyist uh, because they have all the money and it's a very fun, very fun thing to do. Questions or comments, worries, anything on your mind that we need to we need to address, we need to talk about? Y'all all right? It sure is an interesting time to be alive. I did not have Russia attacks Ukraine on my uh, bingo card for the year. Uh, this is their third time uh, to do it. I think that this is more serious situation uh, than before, uh, but uh, it's interesting to watch uh, this and try to stay somewhat detached from it uh, because it's really an emotional situation. I was looking at people uh, leaving the country and uh, at the train station, train stations always bring out the tears in people and um, news anchors are are very upset about this. I think objectivity about it went out the window um, when when this started. And so uh, pay attention to it. And uh, if you have questions about it or comments about it, something comes to mind, let me know, say something uh, so that, that we're aware of what you're thinking uh, about during this uh, really difficult time. Um, if it isn't COVID, you know, it's, it's uh, an invasion now. And uh, last night, somebody pointed out that it might be better to refer to people in Ukraine as uh, uh, resistors. What they're, what they're comparable to is uh, the invasion of Paris uh, by the Germans in World War II. Uh, and those folks were known as the resistance and uh, they were not part of support uh, for Germany. They resisted and uh, did so quite effectively. Um, so uh, you, may, you may think that this is more of a comparable situation to that. But let me say this about that. If you are trying to compare, contrast these things, uh, this conflict you know, and, and world war, they don't translate very well and it's really important. And I think sloppy history does a job of trying to compare and contrast these things. You left that behind in junior high, I hope. Things are what they are uh, right now. They don't translate well uh, into, well, what was it like in 1941? Well, it was in 1941. That's not where we are now. Uh, so things are quite different and, uh, you know, it's, it's easy. We think we get a handle on stuff 
when we compare it to something that's happened before and you miss kind of the point and the nuance uh, and the importance of now when you have to compare and contrast it to anything. You know, don't worry about that. It simply is what it is. Um, and interestingly enough, being a product of the Cold War um, and growing up in the Cold War, um, we were always taught that uh, the Russians you know, were a very effective fighting military force. I mean, after all, they had done so well fighting the Germans uh, I don't know if if 900 days siege on Leningrad was a good, you know, fighting effectively, uh, and they lost about 50 million people in World War II, um, largely because their strategy is to just throw people at opposing forces. I'm very surprised at how poor a performance of the Russian army with this. We were taught that they were very effective and, and very scary and very capable. And this doesn't quite look to be the same, but then again, I'm not the mother of, of a Hungarian child killed by uh, the Russians, but I would have expected quite different fighting, fighting tactics, uh, like bombing uh, from the air, uh, movement on the ground with tanks, and then you follow up with infantry. And all of this just kind of looks you know, sort of like a um, a tornado on the ground. It doesn't it doesn't have that kind of efficiency uh, at all. And so that doesn't mean that by saying that that doesn't mean that I'm trying to get you to feel sorry for the Russian army. No, uh, when I was a student there in 1983, when I came home uh, from uh, having been in Ukraine for a while and having been uh, really all over what was then the, the Soviet Republic. Um, one of the first things when I was interviewing for a job and the CIA was talking to me about a job, uh, one of the things that I noticed when I was there was that, yes, there were a lot of people in uniform, but all of their shoes were different. They didn't have government issued shoes. There wasn't uniformity. They, they all had the same uniforms, of course, the uniforms around Moscow looked nicer and were tailored well, and they had government issue shoes. But as you moved further out, you didn't have that. They had shoes from home. And that told me a great deal that their industrial capabilities and their funding for the army wasn't really directed that way. Uh, if you can't shoe your own army, how much of a threat are they really? And certainly they're not an economic threat. Uh, Russia had, they don't now, the ruble's worth pennies. Um, they had an economy that was smaller than Texas economy, uh, which says a great deal about how big Texas economy and California's economy is. But the Russians really have no strong economic base except for gas and oil. And by the way, I don't know if you realize this, but Russia the, is the world's largest producer of oil. Everybody always thinks it's the Middle East, but it's not, it's Russia. And so the worry is what's going to happen with oil. And of course, gas prices here are pretty high and they're probably gonna get higher. That has nothing, by the way, to do with the president. The president has nothing to do with gas prices. And if somebody tells you that, they don't understand what they're talking about. It's all supply and demand. Uh, it's all market forces. The president can say, gee, I really wish this gasoline wasn't that high, but he can't really get the price down unless the oil companies are willing to do that themselves. And of course they're not. Uh, what the president can do is release uh, from our uh, security reserves, we keep oil, squirreled away in case we need it for for an armed conflict he can release that oil and because there will be more oil in the market the price will will drop uh, but it it should not be unusual to see four dollar a gallon gasoline uh and and i know it's not quite there yet but but it could be and in california it is it is that way 
they have a different tax structure about their gas than than we do. But um, if I were y'all, if I could fill up the car, uh, I would fill it up uh, because you don't know. Uh, I don't think supply is going to be a, a problem, but I do think the cost of gas is going to continue uh, to go up. So let me try to get the dog to quit barking here. I have my fingers crossed that that will, that will stop. And we uh, should talk about political participation and talk first about public opinion. When I say that phrase, public opinion, it deals with the collection of popular views about something perhaps a person or a local or national event, or, or even about what's happening uh, in Ukraine right now, a collection of popular views about something, perhaps a person, local or national news event, uh, or a new idea. What, what are people uh, developing strong attitudes? You might wanna use the, the term attitude when we're talking about public opinion. Many years ago, that phrase, public opinion, was really crystallized in a book written by a fellow named Walter Lippmann. He was the first journalist, if you will, to take note of what a force public opinion can be. And it's interesting if you look at this conflict in Russia and Helsinki, uh, I, darn Helsinki, that must be some kind of, I spent some time uh, in Finland when I was there. And that's the second time today I've done that. I have friends that live in Helsinki. And so uh, I guess they're kind of on my mind. Finland is a constant source of aggravation for the Russians. These folks in Ukraine, uh, where I have spent some time there too. Uh, these folks in Ukraine are uh, getting a lot of public opinion in their general direction that, that the sympathies of the American public are really with them by and large. Um, I think it took some folks a while to, to land at that, particularly those Americans who are enamored of Vladimir Putin and who think that uh, Putin's approach to government is the appropriate one, or dare I say, some people think he's a genius. That's really stretching it. But at any rate, um, it's, it's interesting how people's public opinion, they're trying to shift it to support of Ukraine. Uh, there were a number of people who really uh, like Russia and who really sympathize with Russia, Fox News being one of those. And it's interesting to see how they're trying to straddle this and parse this because public opinion, the general public's opinion, is really uh, with sympathies uh, with the Ukraine. Where do people's opinions come from? And this is something that's tremendously interesting to me. Um, I uh, keep in contact with some folks, I'm still friends with some folks that I went to school with, uh, public school, uh, first through 12th grade together. And we talk about this regularly, that here we are, we were all raised in lower blue collar, uh, families, uh, dads worked, moms worked secondary kind of jobs if they did work. And there were periods of time when they didn't work uh, when we were little. And we talk about this all the time that our public opinions about things are very different than the people we went to public school with. And I'm very interested in that. We, we have very similar backgrounds. But our politics today is miles apart. My view about government, of course, it's my profession, but 
my view about government is somewhat different than say the kids who grew up next door to me um, in, in the same socioeconomic uh, frame. What is different? And you might notice that as you go to college and you make friends and you keep in touch with the ones that you uh, went to school with, you may notice differences in your opinion and theirs. And so I'm always interested in this. I think it's, I think it's terribly interesting how different pe who, people who are in the same settings and the same socioeconomic background, how different their opinions can be from each other. And what are the factors that make people have the opinions that they do and make people have differing views about the same set of circumstances. Let me give you some more information about this. Our attitudes are affected by our personal beliefs and represent the preferences we form based on our life experience and values. A person who suffered racism or bigotry may have a skeptical attitude toward the actions of authority figures, for example. Um, if you've had a bad run-in with the police, you might not necessarily believe everything that the man says to you. Uh, beliefs are closely held ideas that support our values and expectations about life and politics. The idea that we're all entitled to equality, liberty, freedom, and privacy is a belief that most people in the United States share. We may acquire this belief by growing up in the United States or by having come from a country that did not afford these valued principles uh, to its citizens. That's kind of a, a nice way of looking at this when in fact, our views uh, can be just alarmingly divergent. As your textbook points out, it, it says that uh, the idea that most of us are entitled to equality and liberty and freedom and privacy is a belief that most people in the United States have. That may be true. It might be true. But if you apply that to specific in, uh, interest, and I'll give you an example, and, and I, I'm I'm prepared, I'm going to brace myself for to y'all's reaction about this. But there it says that people have the belief that everybody has a right to privacy. Well, if you parse that out and think about it a little differently, you know, privacy is the foundation of our beliefs about reproductive rights. We think that the government, and when I say we think, I'm prepared for, you know, a third of the country to automatically disagree with what I'm saying. It might be two thirds of the country, but it's certainly in the last 50 years, it's been the law of the land that on the grounds, on the basis of privacy, a person has the right to determine their own reproductive freedom their own reproductive uh, capacity, that birth control of you know, in, uh, specifically abortion and generally birth control um, is a private matter. It doesn't have anything to do with the government. Well, in, in about two months, you're gonna get a Supreme Court ruling that will re either return us to the way things were in the 1970s where we lived in sort of this patchwork quilt of rights where some states allowed for abortion and other states did not. Some of my law school buddies say, okay, that's the way that's gonna come down. And I have a different view about that. I don't think the Supreme Court will be quite that generous. What I think the Supreme Court is gonna do is outlaw abortion altogether. You know, why? If you accept that abortion uh, is terminating a life, then why do people in New York get to terminate lives, but people in Texas do not? Um, you, you can't have a country these days with 
because we sh we straddle different different uh, distances quite quite easily. You really can't have a country these days where you allow rights in one state but don't allow those rights in another. And what I mean by that is it, it some people believe that it is up to the states to determine whether or not a woman can secure a legal abortion. Uh, why should women in New York have that right and women in Texas not? It's going to be a little difficult to explain that unless you remember what I said to y'all about states have a right to protect uh, the health, safety, morality, and welfare of its citizens, then under that rubric in uh, Amendment 10, uh, uh, yeah, um, well, wait a minute. Let me think for a second. Yeah, in in Amendment 10 to the Constitution, what you're looking at are states have some rights that the founders did not anticipate and that states have the ability to regulate what? Those four police powers uh, to regulate uh, safety, morality, health, and welfare, and abortion laws fall under that. So they see a state-by-state -state handling of, of that uh, reproductive right. Or there will be some people on the Supreme Court who say there's no right to abortion anywhere in this federal constitution, and there's no right to privacy, because that's the basis of Roe v. Wade, that there's no right to privacy in this constitution, and they will abolish abortion altogether. What, what were you going to say? I had a quick question about the, the abortion thing. Yeah. Um, so I know you were saying that Roy versus Wade, right, and something like that. So it's been happened before. Will someone else be able to run later on and come back in and change that? Will it sure. be an ongoing thing? Will they just sure. Law changes all the time. And we change with the law. And so 50 years ago, the Supreme Court was able to say, we see a right to privacy in this Constitution. This current Supreme Court, the, the vote for a right to privacy isn't there. You only have the rights that that Supreme Court says you have. And so, sure, you can come up with a, a, a different Supreme Court in about 50 years. That'll see it a different way. Right now, those three younger members of the Supreme Court put there by uh, then President Trump, they're in their early 50s. So you've got about 35, 40 years of their views uh, that you're going to have to swim through. And that court is very committed to rolling back the last 80 years of Supreme Court jurisprudence, beginning with the New Deal. And so lots of things are going to be declared unconstitutional. Uh, and a lot of the Constitution's really safeguards in it that came about in the last 80 years are going to be gone. Uh, another one, and you better brace yourself for what I'm going to say. I'm going to say this, brace yourself. Birth control pills, just because they were invented in 1960, didn't mean you had a right to them. States busily went about criminalizing birth control pills. And it took a Supreme Court case of Griswold versus Connecticut to secure the right for married couples to get a prescription for birth control and to have birth control pills. Griswold versus Connecticut. Okay. When abortion is criminalized, be prepared for birth control pills to be next. Quick question there, because it's like they're going to stop, they don't want to um, do the abortion. They're going to stop the birth control. So you're going to have so many people that are having kids. 
then that started turning to a lot of people relying on government assistance. And I thought that was one of the big issues that, you know, what if, it's supposed to be, go ahead. Government assistance, do you, do you think there'll be any left? That's you the know, thing, it's gonna be, that's you know, kind that's of, I'm getting at, it's gonna be a lot of kids that are yeah, gonna but, suffer from this. But wait a minute, you think anybody cares about that? What I'm driving at is people have chipped away at so-called rights to Medicare or rights to Medicaid, or for instance, Planned Parenthood provides more than birth control pills or abortion services. They might be the only health clinic within a hundred miles. In Texas, there are over 100 counties that have no hospitals, okay? I know that's hard for you to imagine in Houston, but they have no hospitals. And so the folks who are pro birth might be anti-government assistance. And so don't assume, this is so important. I'm so glad you brought this up. Don't assume the way that you live now is going to be concrete. If anything, you know, Buddhists teach that the world is impermanent. And I think that's an interesting philosophy. The law doesn't stand still. People who interpret that law bring every bit of themselves to that moment. And so if they are anti-public assistance, okay, we can take care of that. We can abolish public assistance. Nowhere in the Constitution does it say you have a right to that. These people are what are known as originalists. Now, frankly, I'll be straight up with you. Nobody in law school with me ever talked like that. We didn't talk about the law in terms of being an originalist or a, a progressive or anything like that. That is kind of a made up political science sort of thing. But there are people who believe that the Constitution should be interpreted exactly the way that it reads. And it doesn't say anything about public assistance in it. So do governments really have to provide that for people? Well, about 90, almost 100 years ago, right at 100 years ago, public assistance is unheard of. We didn't have that. We didn't have Medicare or Medicaid. You know, that happened in the middle of the Johnson administration. So don't make assumptions about where the law is because that doesn't necessarily mean what's going to happen. Birth control pills will be next. And they can strike. The right to birth control pills was settled on what? The right to privacy. And there's just, there is no right to privacy. You have to look at the con Constitution in a particularly good mood to find that there's anything in it that says anything about privacy. The Fourth Amendment says that if the government wants in your house, they have to have a warrant. And it says that people have a right to be safe uh, in their uh, persons, uh, per, uh, safe in their persons and, and papers uh, from unreasonable search and seizure. So that means you have to have a warrant to go into somebody's house. Literally, it doesn't say anything at all about birth control or uh, now, what was the status of abortion in 1787? Women routinely aborted uh, fetuses uh, up until that time of feeling motion or has, as the term went, quickening. Uh, if there was no movement uh, yet, then having an abortion was perfectly acceptable in colonial America. But you know, who, laws preventing women from advising about abortion came about when you had midwives. Y'all know what a midwife is, right? She's not a doctor. She's not even a registered nurse. But, you know, if you're going to have a birth at home, sometimes you can have a, a midwife uh, perform that uh, and, and uh, home birth. Um, you know, my, by the way, my parents weren't born in a hospital. Be, having babies in a hospital is a 
relatively new thing. Jimmy Carter was the first president, uh, or, or I should say the last president, uh, born at home and, and wasn't, wasn't born in a hospital. After that, it was, you know, pretty routine. But at any rate, the point is, law changes, law evolves. And uh, you, you were saying that, that there would be more people wanting city or county or government services. If well, it's not more of services. It's just going to be if they're not, you have to think, I think a lot of people that do terminate pregnancies and things like that, for whatever reason, it might be bad or good, whatever. Um, that means now you're going to have people that are not doing it, that's not going to take care of their children, can't take care of their children. You're going to have a higher crime rate because at this point, now I mean, you're going to need to have more people looking for assistance, but not getting it. Because like you said, it might not even be none at some point. And if right. they can't get that, now you're going to have the crime rate go up because that well, point. As long as, and, and by the way, there is a study and it, it is a very, you know, honest and difficult study for some people to read that coincides with the legalization of abortion and the crime rate. And that sounds kind of like social engineering, which freaks everybody out. Uh, but there is a relationship uh, between the two. But fundamentally speaking, most of the rights that have been afforded women have come after the availability of the birth control pill uh, because, and, and there is no Equal Rights Amendment. Uh, students think that all the time, that the Equal Rights Amendment passed. Yippee. Uh, no, it did not. There's nothing in the Constitution saying that you have to treat women equally. Um, why did that come about? Well, in passage of the 1965, I mean, strike that, the 1964 Civil Rights Act, a woman uh, member of Congress really pushed them to put uh, no discrimination on accounting of sex in, in the text of the bill. And these guys kind of to humor her did, and it passed that way. Lo and behold, signs and wonders, you know, it passed that way. So discrimination against women strictly on the basis of being a woman, uh, you had grounds to sue, in other words. But one reason women were able to go to college, one reason women were able to hold a job in the marketplace uh, was because she could control her body. Yeah. It's discriminatory. It's discriminatory to fire a woman because she's pregnant. And, you know, there are laws about that. But if women are unable to control their reproductive rights, their bodies as women, if, if you're thinking, well, she's just going to get pregnant, so why send her to college? Or she's just going to get pregnant, so we're not going to have her as vice president of banking. It's so and so, because she'll just be pregnant and have those kids and have to go home when the kids are sick. Uh, so at any rate, that was the basis for not promoting women or not taking women seriously because well, they couldn't control their own bodies. Basically, if you're looking at a link between uh, an increase in abortion and public policy, when Roe was legalized, when, when the Supreme Court legalized a woman's right to choose, abortions in, that, in this country were about a million abortions a year, and those were illegal abortions. Did legalization change anything? Not the demand for it, not the demand for it didn't really change. You still had about a million women a year seeking uh, to terminate a pregnancy. The difference is that, that there were facilities that were public, open, sanitary, regulated, because women's choices before Roe, about a million a year, were uh, you know, somebody would go to a friend and, and a friend would help a woman terminate her pregnancy. And a lot of times that ended in, in death. 
Yeah, I was going to mention that was right. Uh, I'm going to say if they do stop it, I mean, it's nearly not. It's, it'll be illegal, but it's not going to stop. Now well, you're going to have to worry about yeah. people. No, you're not, you're not going to stop it. But that's that, what I was going to say, yeah, because you're going to have people going back to like back in the old days when they would do it that, you know, with hangers. Yeah. Well, I don't want to just say hangers, but the other ways that they would use right. different you know, methods and it's unsafe, you know. You know herbs, uh, Yes, kind of, uh, poison sort of. Yeah, exactly. Women, women did seek that kind of thing. As long as women have been getting pregnant, there have been women trying to terminate pregnancies. There are hieroglyphics on the pyramids about how to terminate a pregnancy. So that that doesn't change. It's the safety factor. Yeah, it's that's not yeah. Having to cross state lines. It's economics that the cost of an airplane ticket to go terminate a pregnancy. See, clearly, well-to-do people will always be able to afford an abortion. That's not going to be the case for, for lower middle income and the poor. Uh, I think it's interesting that the United States is moving towards criminalizing abortion while Mexico just legalized it. And Colombia oh, wow. legalized it. And so I think that's fascinating that those states where you don't have much separation between church and state, Catholicism is the dominant religion in Mexico, and yet abortion uh, is now legal. And so, I mean, Ireland has legalized abortion, and, and there are infamous stories of deaths of girls uh, attempting to abort. Uh, and dying uh, as a result of that. But let you know. Let me say this about that. We think that Americans have a, a treasure their right to privacy, but I want you to realize it's been something that's been so taken for granted in the last fifty years by two thirds of the population. But now two thirds of the population aren't governing. What you have is. Pretty much well through some of y'all's discussions of gerrymandering, you're aware of this. You have a government that's actually representative of the minority of people. That if the majority support abortion, that's not the direction that the Supreme Court's moving in. You know, that's not the, the direction that state legislatures are moving in. And why is that? Because Democrats have not been able to articulate the reality of their support of those concepts. And I, I gen, I'm gonna say this and y'all can be critical uh, about it. I don't think people actually believed this was going to happen. I don't yeah. think they believed it either. I don't think they believed it. I think Hillary could scream till she was blue in the face that it was gonna happen. And she was right about this and a lot of other things. But it may be that people have to get so close to the loss of rights before they snap back and say, wait a minute, I didn't think that's what you meant. You know, no, that's And by the way, Republicans are long haul, long term planners. They have been planning to take over state legislatures. They have been adamantly working for a much more conservative judiciary. I mean, the, not, the 2016 presidential election was about the Supreme Court. It was about those empty seats that were gonna come vacant under uh, Mr. Trump and who did you, the only reason to pay any attention to who's president folks is the Supreme Court because those are lifetime appointments and they got what they wanted. They can hardly stand themselves. They know that this spring it's going to be, or this summer, it's going to be a very different world than it was in the fall uh, because they're going to strike that. And they're going to strike affirmative action next year. They're going to strike affirmative action. You're not going to have affirmative action in hiring or education after next year. They've agreed to hear the case. They agreed to hear it because they're going to overturn it. 
That's why they picked it. And you will have Clarence Thomas, who is adamantly opposed to affirmative action. He gets very upset about it because um, he went to law school at a time where they looked at applicants based on race and said, you know, there aren't very many black lawyers. Perhaps we should have more black applicants to uh, colleges and universities and law schools. That's why. Okay, that's why. And he was angry about that. And I, I just want to give you a little, a little warning. He'll be the one that writes the opinion for the court against a constitutional protection for affirmative action. Affirmative action, by the way, has more constitutional grounds in its favor than Roe v. Wade does. Because what is affirmative action and its connection to the Constitution? The Constitution says, you know, in, in the first 10 amendments and then later in the 14th amendment that you're entitled to due process of law and that there is, um, in the Fifth Amendment, a due process of law clause for the federal government. And in the 14th uh, Amendment, it says equal opportunity and due process. Equal opportunity only appears in the 14th Amendment, no other place in the, in the Constitution. And equal opportunity is the bedrock of affirmative action. But you're going to see an end to that because conservatives did not support it. The irony that the most conservative Supreme Court justice is an African-American man uh, and he doesn't support affirmative action, although he benefited from it. Um, he wasn't put on the court for affirmative action purposes. Oh, and by the way, irony of ironies, Joe Biden was head of the Senate Judiciary Committee when Justice Thomas was approved. Uh, Justice Thomas, of course, infamously had critics who came before or uh, one person who came before the Supreme Court and said he sexually harassed me. That's a crime under uh, it's a civil matter under uh, our Constitution, uh, Anita Hill. And there were other women there ready to testify against Thomas's nomination. But Joe Biden didn't call him. He didn't call him. And in all fairness to Joe Biden, uh, this was the first time anything like this had ever happened. And the Senate probably wasn't very sure how to handle that. They really didn't know what to do. Uh, they really didn't know what to think. And it was really uh, a, an interesting dilemma. Uh, if you're interested in that whole thing, there's a very good book about it called Strange Justice. And I think it's still in print. And uh, it was written by uh, uh, two women. Uh, one of them, Jill Abramson, is an editor at the New York Times uh, now. Uh, but she was, I want to say, with National Public Radio um, at the time and wrote a book about the whole incident and how the hearings were handled or mishandled. Um, so uh, this that's sort of interesting that 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 is you know kind of come back. I think after Thomas uh, writes that opinion, he's the longest serving person on the court now, and I would not be surprised if he did not retire. Um, I think he'll stay through the Biden administration because he doesn't want to be replaced by somebody um, from Biden's choosing, because that might change the structure of the court, uh, the the voting. Um, the the young woman who was uh, nominated over this past uh, week, and y'all got to see her at the. Um, well, she's been all over the news now. Justice Jackson. Um, She's not going to change the makeup of the court. Breyer, who she clerked for, by the way, Breyer will be leaving and she'll take his place, but you still have a 6-3 split on the court in favor of conservatism. Um, so 
I know you're thinking, you know, what, what in the, but, but it's important that she be there. I mean, it's long overdue uh, for an African-American woman to serve on the Supreme Court. It's long overdue uh, for that, for that to be. Uh, there are lots of tremendously qualified African-American women uh, and, and law, law will not, not change in this country until you have more minority men and women on the court uh, or on the federal judiciary or, you know, over here at the Justice of the Peace Office. You know, women and minorities in the law are vital to its uh, understanding and application and, and uh, how we live. And, and I'm talking about more than just your encounters with the police but not limited to your encounters with the police. Uh, men and women and minorities look at that constitution quite, quite differently. Uh, and so really uh, you're not gonna have law for everyone until you have a judiciary for everyone. Um, and, and right now we're still pretty far, still pretty far away from that, okay? So, haven't gotten off on that tangent, but it's important. It was it's important to talk about. We didn't talk about it all semester, and and y'all don't don't be uh, intimidated by by the process. Uh, there are things that you have been told that are admirable, but naive, and so you know I would have thought when I was your age and in your uh, position early in college that the law was the law was the law and that it didn't change and that everybody knows if it's a crime to run the stop sign, we don't run the stop sign. You know, we all have innocent views and we can't function really without that kind of, of hope toward um, legal issues. But we all know that not a, justice isn't equal before the law. And we know that well-to-do people have a different time with the law. Uh, and we know that I mean, realistically, we have to understand that it's different when you're a woman. It's different when you're an African-American. It's different when you're Hispanic. It's different. Can you believe in this country in this year that Asians cannot walk down the street without vitriol and being attacked. What the hell, you know, but yeah. And there you can, you can go back in the history of being an Asian American and discover that there were actual laws about how it was hunky dory to discriminate against Asians. And you know, the, the laws out in California were really written in such a way as as to discriminate and curtail against you know Asian Americans, it was, it was dreadful. It was horrible, and uh, you can make it all the way through life and not know those things. But your life will be a lot richer if you understand where we've come from. You know, and and I think it's fascinating at this time in our lives that there seems to be people who are genuinely afraid for you to know what really happened. They want that Disney version of the world. I don't know why that got popular to say that Disney version of the world where everything's sweet and innocent. I don't know y'all, I've been traumatized by Disney, Disney movies, you know, Bambi, my gosh, they kill his mom, you know. Moms are always getting killed or, or kept away from babies. Dumbo, for example, he can't reach his mother, you know, his, his whole, Learning how to fly has to do with can't reach his mother. They're pretty sad people over at Disney. But at any rate, it's a mighty rosy world if you don't know these things. And it's important for you to know them because we're better when you know the truth. Don't ever be afraid of the truth. You know, and don't be afraid of our history. We can take it. We can shoulder it. We can build a better society if we know where we where we hail from and what happened. Okay. So uh, somebody said, I, I remember doing a summer job as a cashier at a supermarket. Uh, and during the Asian hate 
uh, was at its peak and I got many looks and many people were obviously avoiding my section because of me being an Asian. I'm sorry that that happened to you. By the way, since you said supermarket, here's a little assignment for you. There's a book, a, sh a short story uh, collection, and it has a story in it called A&P, uh, you know, the grocery store chain, A&P grocery store. Uh, you might not ever have heard of them. I grew up uh, with A&P grocery stores in Dallas. And it's the the writer uh, of the story is uh, John Cheever, and you ought to read it. It's it's about a young man who has a job sacking groceries at A and P in the summer in a beach community, and some of his friends come in from school, and the girls are wearing swimsuits, and they don't like that in the grocery store, uh, which is weird in a beach town for you not to accept people in a sw in a swimsuit. And the, and the manager of the store, store told the, the young man, our, our uh, hero in the story, told him to go tell the girls that they had to leave the grocery store because they had swimsuit on. And he quits rather than do that because that's not what kind of person he is. It's a pretty good story. All right. So when you develop and you might want to take a note in the margin of your of your reading here when you um notice a difference in how you think or feel about something let's say that you're pro-choice and your whole family is anti-choice what made you and you don't have to tell me personally it's not but i want you to think about this what made you have a different point of view? Because one of the most important elements of why we think the way we do is parental guidance or parental exposure to ideas. Why does somebody vote Republican? Because their daddy was a Republican and there's probably not much more thought that goes into it than that. You know, when I was growing up, the, the socioeconomic group that I was in voted, their parents voted Democratic, but it changed about the time I went to uh, college. Why did that change? I went to college, uh, graduated from high school in 1980. And so the Reagan Democrat, uh, Ronald Reagan's presidency and his election caused a lot of people who voted Democratic uh, in the 60s and 70s to vote Republican uh, in, the, in the 80s. And so that was a huge swing in change uh, for the country. But usually if you grow up in a house full of Republicans or a house full of Democrats, that's going to be your political party too. What changed that too? What helped change that? The Vietnam War, where you had sons and fathers no longer speaking to each other because of their positions on the war. Big events, you know, parent, parents, okay, are a big factor. Big events themselves can change our perspective about uh, voting or about political figures. Um, let me give you give you an example of that. Y'all grew up with 9-11, right? You were around when that tragedy occurred. It might have an impact on you. Uh, I grew up with the Kennedy assassination. I was 18 months old, but I grew up in Dallas. And a lot of the places frequented by Oswald were in my neighborhood. Um, he uh, had visited his wife at a house two blocks away from my home uh, growing up in, in Irving. And so it was always something that was around. It was always something that was talked about. I know people personally who testified before the Warren Commission about the assassination. And so it's always been important to me, always been a factor for me. Um, 
some some people believe that growing up during the early 60s in the civil rights movement that Dr. King had a tremendous impact on the way they saw the world. Okay, um, the shuttle explosion, uh, the shuttle disaster had an impact on on some people. They were in grade school when that happened, and they saw that in class with their classmates. So big events, and certainly, um, I would say growing up with the notion that elections are fixed or not accurate will color people's opinions about the legitimacy of authority. Uh, and that that will have some impact on them uh, and the way they the way they see the world. Religion plays a tremendous role in shaping public opinion. People who are deeply religious and actively so, their worldview is different than people who are not as religious or who are not religious or who are of a different faith. So religious views can really color political views. <clears throat> First time I was ever campaigning for anybody actively, um, I was in church and somebody stood up and wanted to talk about a particular candidate and, and they brought ca candidates to church <clears throat> for people to see and meet. And that was very interesting to me because my view of religion was a pretty big separation of church and state kind of thing. And I was sort of shocked to see uh, people be actively political uh, in church, in that little building. You know, this is the church and this is the steeple and you open the door. Yeah, right. Remember that nursery rhyme? Okay. But people actually campaigned from the pulpit and that was really surprising uh, to me. And if you doubt the importance of that, I mean, even Bill Clinton would go to uh, um, Joel Osteen's church as a guest of Joel Osteen. So people uh, are influenced by the church experience. And they're not just influenced one or two days a week, but they incorporate church uh, into their day-to-day -day lives and, and it informs their opinions uh, of, the, of the world. Um, college and non-college education, so we could say education, has a tremendous impact on public opinion and developing public opinion. Uh, that That is a, a tremendously important element of that. All of these things are called agents of socialization. Church, um, political events, um, you know, um, the time you grow up, you know, what's going on in the world at that time, School itself can be a real agent of socialization. Um, it those kinds of things. What gives you and think about this this week. Um, think about what kinds of things have shaped your public or uh, your political beliefs. You know what do you think has influenced you uh, in terms of your uh, political beliefs. I, I'm I'm very fascinated with it. Very interested in that, and so that'll help further our discussions about uh, public opinion and how important those things are. And we need to then segue over into talking about political parties. And it's a very interesting time to talk about political parties because. They're always in a flux. They're always changing. However, there is quite a change in the modern Republican Party that used to have a very clear, well-articulated agenda. We are for these things. And now the Republican Party 
is sort of the party of Trump, the party of this one fella, uh, this party of the values of this one fella. And I'm very curious about how Republicans deal with that. Do they still adhere to their values, which may be quite different you know, than Mr. Trump's values? And y'all, it's very unusual in our politics to have one fella shape an entire political party the way that Mr. Trump has. I mean, when a, a Democrat is in office, that Democrat is head of party. So when Mr. Obama was president, he was head of the Democratic Party. Mr. Obama, uh, that that was the that was the case. Mr. Biden, he's the top Democrat. He sort of sets the tone for the for the party. But when they leave office. Most presidents, most formal pres former presidents sort of disappear and they play a lot of golf and nobody talks about them anymore and listens to them. But that's not the case with Mr. Trump, who's very obviously wanting to run for president in 2024. Uh, over the week, uh, there's been a convention of conservative uh, political, uh, the Conservative Political Action Committee or CPAC had a convention and Mr. Trump led his party in a straw poll. Y'all know what that is, right? Where it, the poll doesn't really matter, but that's sort of what their thinking is. Mr. Trump was, was leading as being the most favored politician, a uh, Republican politician to run in 2024, followed far back by DeSantis from Florida. I didn't see Greg Abbott getting the attention that Mr. Abbott may like. You know, he wants to run uh, for president too. Okay? So everybody wants to wants to run, but um, Mr. Trump has so dominated uh, the field and dominates uh, Republican thinking these days, and it's quite unusual uh, uh, to have that. Okay, let's quit. Let's have a nice weekend. Uh, rest up, and we should be uh, progressing right along there. All of this stuff in this political participation chapter is kind of familiar to you, I hope, and and it overlaps, and some of it might be kind of repetitive. So uh, watch watch your interest in that. Thank y'all. Have a good weekend, and and we'll see you on Tuesday. I have a question. Sure. So um, I saw that there's a demographic of Congress discussion post in the PSLO submission area. Uh -huh. I know they're the same thing, but in the PSLO submission area, I've got a um, missing on that or a zero. So Don't worry something? about it. Don't worry about it. I have 220 of those things to grade. I'm nowhere. Oh, near. okay, okay. Yeah, I'm nowhere near uh, getting finished oh, okay. with that. So no, no, you do not have a zero. You may have a lack of a grade, but but uh, no, you're fine. Okay. Oh, okay. Perfect. Yeah, and um, another one is that the test is um, next Tuesday. Are we still keeping at the same date or is it being moved? This coming Tuesday. Uh huh. We were thinking about that. Won't we? Won't we push that back a little bit to like maybe Thursday? Let me think about it. Okay. I know you're going. No, no. I have to know something. I'll send you an email about it. Okay. Because I really oh, think. Okay. Uh, the thing about doing this PS, P, S, L, O. Uh, anyway, this thing about taking care of that little exercise for the department kind of threw right. it off. Um, you know, y'all had to put a lot of thought in that, which is, you did. Uh, mm -hmm. So I want to put that off a little bit. Anybody have okay. a question? Thank you. Have a great day. Hope you feel better. Thank you. I'm doing really well. I, I went to physical therapy today and they were kind of like, you don't need to come here. You're doing fine. So, so that, that was good. Any, any other questions? All right, let's quit. We'll talk to y'all later. Question. Yes. Since um, Biden is now like, I, I heard from the state of union that uh, he's going to like reduce the subscription, like fees from, uh, I assume like medical things. Yeah, I um, remember. 
he can propose it, but I, that's not going to happen. That's uh -huh. Congress is doing. He can't say, oh, I had this idea. I think I'll implement it. He has uh -huh. to get Congress convinced to pass a law for, in, in that regard. Prescription drugs are hideously expensive. Yeah. And the, it, abroad, prescription drugs are not nearly as costly because their governments negotiate those prices down. And, and so people will be able to do the same thing here in the United States. I mean, it's appalling that insulin costs what, what it does. I mean, that, that's just ridiculous. And so Biden would like, and the Democratic Party would like to change that, but I don't think they have the votes to do that in Congress. Because some people in Congress would disagree on that? No, because some people in Congress take great big campaign contributions from pharmaceutical oh. companies. All right. Thank you. And so, yeah, they block that. Okay. It's mm -hmm. an idea. It's nice. But you got to have the votes to do it, and I don't oh. think he has. The votes. I see. So it doesn't but, it doesn't go right away. You just have to like, you know, get the votes in and like get their approval is what they're saying. Like like we, like it was discussed back in like chapter one. You have to like get approval. Well, you have to get Congress to write the law. Oh, write yeah. the law. Uh, write the bill basically. Yeah, and well. You've got to get them to write the bill, introduce the bill, get the bill out of committee, get the bill to go through the process and get a majority of votes for it in the mm. House and Senate. Mm, it's a long that's, process. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's why we think a lot of things, but they don't actually they happen. Biden, I'll put it to you this way. Biden's not a dictator. Mm. He can't say there will be fair pricing for pharmaceuticals boom it happens it doesn't work like that mm. a democratic society has the process of congress passes laws and the president executes those laws mm. and he can run on the idea of reducing the cost of pharmaceutical drugs notice mr trump said that to his audience and his supporters and to his Congress, and it didn't happen under him either. Mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. so, so Congress the, is like, yeah. Congress, the legislative branch, and they write legislation, and the president is only there to carry that legislation out. I since, see. Since the advent of Teddy Ro uh, Franklin Roosevelt, we sort of look to the president to have a package or a proposal, but it's got to get through Congress before it's law. Mm. And it's a long process, too, for that to happen. Yep. And long is not the problem. The problem is how interested are these people in actually doing that? And if they take campaign contributions from pharmaceutical companies, which is perfectly legal, they have their reason appealed to. And mm. so they... The votes are there to stop that from happening. Oh, uh, so they're kind of blocking this idea out. They have no interest in passing that law. Mm. None whatsoever. Because in order to get elected, they take campaign contributions that pay for their campaigns. And the campaign contributions against fair pricing in pharmaceuticals is a lot stronger and people who are for fair pricing in pharmaceuticals who are they going to take campaign contributions from the pharmaceutical industry wants their you know wants no law interfering with their ability to make a profit and so they give campaign contributions to keep it from ever coming for a vote it's like a conflict between two sides on who gets the vote. That you live in a capitalist society, you shouldn't be surprised that government um, yeah. is not, you know, is it's competitive. It is an uh, there yeah. are there are more than two sides to every story. More than two sides, yeah, multiple sides. Yeah, I know I shouldn't be surprised. But mm -hmm. it was but it was convincing though, to be to well, be fair. It's a good idea. You know, I, I think 
ice water coming out of the faucet's a good idea, but but I don't look for it to happen. Oh, because it'll never happen, basically. Right. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. well, the only way that it will ever happen is if the dynamic changes and people say, I don't care if that guy is bought, bought and paid for by the pharmaceutical industry. I'm going to have the sense to vote for his opponent. Mm. And you change the makeup of Congress and you get different legislation as a result of that. Mm. You know, the thing about redistricting, mm-hmm. I noticed that everyone sort of gives up when they hear this argument that, well, redistricting is part of a way of life and, and, and they produce these districts where Democrats can't win. Nothing says you have to vote the way they expect your district to vote. You Mm -hmm. can vote against those guys who benefit from redistricting all day long. Here in Fort Bend County, the, the most diverse county in the country, the voting patterns are heavily Democratic. So the legislature wanted to break this up here so that Republicans maintain a competitive stance in Fort Bend County, that they can still get elected uh, regardless of the makeup of Fort Bend County. Don't you think those people in Fort Bend County are smart enough to see through that? They might not vote for a Republican member. Uh, They might vote Democratic. Mm. You know, in other words, people don't have to do what they're predicted to do. So if if you think redistricting is really harmful to your guy, that doesn't mean that you stop voting for your guy. It just means that you have to get more people out to vote. Get more influence. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's all about the influence. Yeah, yeah. All right, questions, comments? All right, let's quit. Thank Thank you for um, correcting me on that one. I wasn't trying to correct you. I was just trying to give you a little more insight oh. uh, about that. Because I didn't uh, know, because I didn't know that he has to like get like Congress to like you know get the votes in for his like policy to work. I didn't well, know. yeah, it doesn't happen in a vacuum. Presidents can't make uh, law; they okay. enforce the law oh. that's by Congress. So, right. but Joe Biden can say, "I want pharmaceutical uh, people to quit." making such a gigantic honking uh, profit. He can want that all he wants. He can't affect reality unless he can get Congress to change the law. And it's just not in their interest to do it. So he can say that and he can get people to think, well, as long as I vote for Joe Biden, then somebody's going to care about me. But the reality is Joe Biden is swimming upstream in the pharmaceutical industry. Pharmaceutical industry owns the water, the pool, mm-hmm. uh, and, and who gives swimming lessons. I mean, that that group of lobbyists is tremendously huge. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. it, it all depends how Congress feels about it. It, it all depends. The majority of Congress might agree but that change in the law doesn't occur uh without you know it doesn't take place in a vacuum there's always going to be resistance to change and so looking at that one particular problem you can see that you have to get the house behind you you have to get the senate behind you and even then you could have a president veto that legislation Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's it's an arduous process. Frankly, Congress is designed to protect the status quo. I saw the status quo, the balance of all. <laughs> I see. Yeah. So re- change is an extremely unusual thing. Mm, and it, it rarely happens, right? It rarely happens. It is extremely unusual. Uh, for the House, the mm. Senate, and the courts um, to agree mm. on anything. But mm. it, it protects the status quo. It's stable. 
and you don't have uh, tremendous amounts of upheaval. It's very unusual to have a public policy that that changes uh, a great deal about America. Um, legalizing same-sex marriage is one of those things that's very different uh, and and radically changes the way that we live. And mm -hmm. what what happened was it was legislated not by Congress but by the courts. When Congress refuses to act, sometimes we have to go to the courts to get relief. Mm -hmm. Brown versus the Board of Education, you know, integrating the schools so that black mm -hmm. and white go to school together. That was so controversial that the courts had to reach that decision because Congress sure wasn't going to touch it. Mm -hmm. you know, Eisenhower said, yeah, they made that decision. Now let's see them enforce it. The Supreme Court doesn't have any enforcement mechanism. We just agree that we're going to go by what the Supreme Court says. Mm. You know, look at it this way. Birth control pills, they're pretty popular, okay? Mm -hmm. And people support birth control pills too. And if that were the case, that they really expected birth control pills to be uh, protected by law, then why in the world are they voting for people who are going to take birth control pills away from people. I don't think people understand that. I don't think that they, uh, I think they have the same experience that you just had. Mm. That they don't really think that their government could be at odds with what they want. You know, it, it, it seems ridiculous that pharmaceutical prices are as high as they are, that people cannot afford insulin. Uh, that 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 seems ridiculous, it. But it's the reality that we live with. I just don't think people realize that. I, I yeah. think that they're distracted by a bunch of stuff rather than paying attention to the to the actual way we live on the ground. That there are mm. people who are do, doing without insulin, and they're going to die an early death as a result of it. A lot of people don't think about government and politics until it directly affects them. Mm -hmm. yeah true yeah. that's actually that's actually a fact right there yeah yeah all right we'll see y'all later talk to y'all later all right thank you bye thank you bye